Hello, Global Theater. My name is Jerry Fielka. Today is September 19, 2023. We want to thank Rob Grant and his amazing podcast, I'm Probably Wrong About Everything. And a thanks to Will Erickson for inviting me to our guest today, Greg Pritikin. Is that the right way to pronounce it? Absolutely. Greg, where in the heck are you calling in from? I'm calling you from Los Angeles, California, from a, a little neighborhood called Angelino Heights, which is the oldest neighborhood in Los Angeles. How cool is that? Okay, the first question is, what is the best thing for a human being? What is the best thing for a human being? Well, that is a very unexpected question. <laughs> Uh, not, not what, not what I was uh, expecting, but I, I love it even more. The best thing for a human being uh, is other human beings. Dude, that's the right answer, man. You started off amazing. Okay. What's your favorite form of information, how it comes into you? Well, that is another excellent question. I would say, I would say overall, first and foremost, reading, because when you're reading, you are absorbing the information in a more focused way. Um, you, you, you paint a clearer image of what you're reading, uh, because you're using your imagination, you, you are getting the information and then you are uh, painting it as you read it so that you see it as well, whether you're reading an article or a book or anything. So I would say reading, I would say, practically speaking, my favorite form of information by default is the radio is I, I live by the radio. Dude, I, that's, I, that's, that's my two favorites right there. But let me, let me just veer off. We'll get back. Everything will come around full circle. And if I interrupt you, you say, Hey, I want to suss that out please do. But I wanted to ask you about reading for a second. Did you become a reader? One, because your parents told you to read. Two, they did it as an example or on your own? I'd like to answer this question because it's a very important one. I, I have a six-year-old daughter who's just learning to read now. I started reading at a very young age, younger than most children. And the only reason I was able to learn to read at such a young age had nothing to do with uh, intelligence or natural intelligence or discipline or parents. It had to do with one simple thing. I needed to be able to read the TV guide so that I knew when the monster movies were on TV. <laughs> what age is this? You're starting to read TV guide. I would, I would say probably around five. Now that's again, because your parents told you to read, they did an example or on your own? Well, my parents were readers. So I, I, I saw them reading all the time and I intrinsically knew it was an important thing to do that I would eventually have to read. But what was more inspiring was when I learned that this little magazine that we received in the mail contained contained all of the secrets of horror movies on television and the only way that i could decipher those secrets was to learn to read and that's what inspired me to read <laughs> wait i gotta ask what uh you, did you know salvador dolly did the cover of tv guide in 62 what year were you born I, I was born a little bit later than that. I was. Born <laughs> Did you, that is an amazing magazine. Uh, and I, I was in college studying film before there were film classes in the mid seventies in Ann Arbor. There was not film classes yet, but in the English department, they sort of had these film studies. In one of them, we had a read TV guide <laughs> as as like required reading. Ah, that's, that's that probably probably around the same time that I was learning to read. The TV. <laughs> okay, why do you think humans collect or gather information? Uh, well, that's a, an excellent question. I love that question. I think it is. Uh, it's in our DNA. 
and yeah. I'll explain what I mean. Would you would you like a like a, maybe a, a a one and a half minute answer to that? No, here here's the deal. Okay, I've switched my format. You can go on as long as you want. I welcome stories, anecdotes, extensive. Because if we don't get done in ninety minutes, we can just part plan a part two. This has been a shift in forty years of interviewing. I've sort of shifted into like because my suggestion is keep it down to two to four minutes. I'm sort of fudging on that now so go as long as you want yeah okay well i i, I still believe concision is a virtue so i'll i'll do my <laughs> that's good um i think that i uh, i i mean you're opening a can of worms i think because th this is um i'm going to let you into my entire worldview uh my entire politics with with this answer and that is uh human beings human beings are a fairly successful species we've been around for what three to five hundred thousand years which is very brief in biological time but we're a successful species because we have a unique balance between uh fear and curiosity and i think the human brain is comprised of and I mean every human brain, of different parts of curiosity and fear. And that is the way we survived. And I think that that our success as a species is, is due to the fact that we maybe are 60, 60 to 80% curiosity to that 20% fear or whatever it is. The fear needs to be in the minority because otherwise there will be no progress. We will, we will know nothing. We will learn nothing. And we will eventually become extinct if we are ruled by the fearful. This is why I think politics are almost, uh, is almost a, a genetic, a genetic symptom of our, uh, biology as human beings. And why you, if you look at the world, the world seems to be almost evenly split. Um, between the curious and the fearful. A little more in the curious side, though. The world is more curious than it is fearful, which is why we keep doing great things in spite of all the bad things we do because of that. And I think that we have a natural drive to learn because that's part of our curious makeup as human beings. Yeah. Some of us more so than others, of course. It's brilliantly put, Greg, and I appreciate how articulate you are and uh, concise. It's good because the next question was, is this need or want to collect information more innate or more invented? And you started off with ESP by saying it's more it's it's in our DNA. But I'm curious because there was one word you brought up in that uh, were in the words was. Uh, bad. So it's interesting because who who determines what is bad and who invented the word bad? Like, were we born with a sense of what is bad? Someone along the way went, oh, that's bad. Whereas um, the Balinese have no, McLuhan loves this line, the Balinese have no word for art. They do everything as well as they can. Yeah. So they didn't, they didn't go, that art is bad, that art is good. They just did it. So we'll, we'll get into all this, but it's very interesting how you divvy that out. So you were basically saying curiosity and fear are, are innate in humans. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so do thoughts create emotions? Certainly they can. And I, but I also think that emotions create thoughts as well. So yeah. I, I think that thoughts create, I think that's what art is. Art is a thought creating an emotion. Yeah. Uh, life perhaps is the emotion creating a thought. Life, L-I-F-E or light, L-I-G-H-T. Life. life. L-I-F-E, yeah. Yes. Okay, fill in the blank, Greg. I don't know what I think until I take mushrooms. 
<laughs> that was a great answer. I know you did. You, we were talking about that in our group today. You know, mushrooms aren't aren't. Uh, what, what's the verb when you you met you turn mold on rye bread into LSD? You uh, yeah. You know what is that word? Do you uh, synthesize it or you don't? Yeah. Like like all these drugs. DMT, ketamine, which ones of them are come out of nature, but some of them are, are manipulated by humans. And then which ones of them are just, boom, you, you pick it. So take yeah. mushrooms. That was good. So can humans think without language? You're, you're, you are really forcing me to think without language right now um, <laughs> well, there's two th there's two things there's two ways of answering that um uh when th there have been uh examples of discovering children raised on their own or raised without any pr parents um raised by wolves if you will if you have two children locked in a closet from birth and they're nourished and they're fed and they're allowed to grow and stay healthy in that closet, they will develop a language. That is one of one of the defining characteristics of human beings is the inherent, the inherent advent of language. So I, 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 and if you look at the examples of pre-verbal children, which, which when they have nobody to communicate with, they don't have a language of their own. Um, if they are like savage children, like, like the, uh, the, the um, wild one. Yeah. Like the Truffaut's movie, the wild yeah. one. Yeah, like wild child, yeah, or whatever. A wild child, yeah. Yes, l'enfant sauvage, um, and where there is no language, uh, there's a deep, deep savageness to humans, and the savageness does not come from something animalistic. It comes from a deep, inherent frustration that they are not able to do what human beings evolved to do which is to communicate through language yeah. so i think that that human beings might need language to think but they don't necessarily think in language all the time we also think in images and and, yeah. and feelings yeah yeah that was good and have you seen that film called the wolf pack where the kid, four kids, you know about it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The do documentary. <laughs> right. Okay. So um, Chomsky says, because what you sort of went along with is that Chomsky says we're inherent to have language. It's in our DNA to have language. Absolutely. I was re re referencing Chomsky in my thinking because yeah. he was the, the great linguist of the 20, 20th century. Yeah. He says that a language is not just words. It's a culture, a tradition, a unification of community, a whole history that creates what a community is. What do you do when language doesn't work? When language breaks down, what do you do? Well, I think we could we could find many examples of that. I think that we are in a period in history where where language doesn't seem to matter um, at this point in time where where there you can put two people in a room and who speak the same language but cannot understand each other yeah i think that um, 
it almost seems like a, like there needs to be something other than language to communicate because language doesn't seem to be sufficient. But this also, going back to my first point, is when you have a curious and a fearful mind and that fearful mind is not encouraged uh, toward the curious, um, no amount of language is going to help. In fact, in fact, you could take a fearful mind and give them a, a, a tremendous vocabulary and tremendous speaking skills, but they cannot communicate truth or curiosity. All they can do is reinforce their own fear, which is what another thing we're seeing right now more than ever. But Greg, what do you do when that happens, when language breaks down? Say you're at the grocery store, you're on your set, and there's a breakdown of communication with language. What do you do? Well, that happens all the time. I mean, there's often breakdowns in communication. Um, you, you know, the, your first response is to yell at somebody <laughs> and, and, and to throw a tantrum. <laughs> But people like me don't get paid enough for the luxury of having a tantrum. So you, <laughs> so you have to you have to figure out a solution. Well, um, what? Give me an example. Like what is what would be a, a typical solution that you would resort to? Uh, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm trying to give you like a real life example uh, because this, I guess, is an interesting segue to connect to um, talking about film, but um, I, I would say, I would say, uh, uh, I, I, I just did a film in which the climax of the film was to take place in the cupola of an old Victorian house, a very small, tight, confined space in the attic of the house where somebody was going to have to fall out of the window of a Victorian house. Picture like the widow's peak of a Victorian house, like yeah. a turret. Uh, the plan all along was to shoot everything practically on location. But for this one particular scene, we were going to build a coppola, uh, an, a, a replica of the coppola with moving walls on a stage with a green screen. And this would be the one, the one scene that would be shot on a stage and not shot in the house. Um, that was the plan. Uh, a week before we were to shoot that scene, we found out that we couldn't afford, we couldn't afford the stage. So then, immediately we had to think, well, what's the alternative? Let's shoot that scene. Let's build that attic turret right on the front lawn of the house that we're shooting and we'll shoot it at an angle where all we see is sky so we won't need a green screen that was the solution then the production designer came to me the next day and said the carpenter's estimates were wrong it was going to cost twice as much as we thought which we couldn't afford so i said you mean we can't we can't build this set. We can't afford to build this set, which we're now shooting in three days. And I said, well, I guess we're just going to have to shoot it on location. And, and, uh, and so we had to shoot it in the actual turret. And I pointing up because it was the turret of, of the house I live in, of my house, which is a 130 year old Victorian in Angelino Heights. Um, so we shot it, you know, so it, it's, it's, you're constantly, you're constantly getting, uh, uh, your, your dreams and your ideas and your vision is constantly being thwarted and compromised and you, you have no choice, but to make the best of it because often, uh, you know, often your, your limitations become your, your best friend. And there's yeah. something lim liberating in art about, about limitations. Yeah. 
No, that's well put. That that was good. It anticipate a lot of questions. We will be getting into film. Do you, your observations, Greg, of humans in general, are we more thinking beings or more feeling beings? I think we're I think we're split. I think I think we're evenly split. Yeah. As part of our part of our survival success. Yeah. I like your word success. We're a successful species. This is a great attitude. It's really teaching me. So far. Yeah. <laughs> so far, that's good. Two questions from Alan Turing, 1950s. One, is thinking a function of the soul? Well, no. I, 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 that, I mean, I, I can't answer that question. I, I, to me, it's a nonsensical question. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a flighty question. It's a poet's question, which has every right to be uttered, but it's a rhetorical question and it can't yeah. be answered. That's good. Two, can machines think? Yes. I think the, the first time I got a pocket calculator, there you go. That, that machine is thinking. There you go. Do you more pursue happiness or more pursue meaning? <sighs> well, I think the the easier route and the easier route and probably the more gratifying route is to pursue happiness. And in that happiness, I think you can find meaning. Yeah. Well, I got it from Viktor Frankl's book called Man's Search for Meaning. He says, meaning tends to last and happiness is more ephemeral. It doesn't last. So. That's, well, that's certainly true. Absolutely. Yeah. But I'll tell you this. I recently... Um, was reunited with friends I hadn't seen in 30 years since I was 19, 20 years old. And um, one of one of the things that made our our bond so strong was the deep, uncontrollable laughter that we shared together. And and when you which to me is the apex of happiness. Yeah. When you when you laugh so hard that your body never forgets it that is the that is the the pinnacle of happiness and therefore yeah. the pinnacle of meaning because yeah. when you realize what life is about so when i see my friends again 30 years later uh we're connected our lives our connection has meaning because yeah. of the laughs that we shared Way back then, you're saying those laughs are like in your muscle memory or something. They're like ingrained. That was good. I, I get that. So does the brain more detect consciousness or create it? Like is consciousness there bubbling away and we're more so detecting it or more so creating it? That that question is um, is too challenging for me right now. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> can, you, can you make a note to come back to that when it makes more oh, sense? Oh, that's, that's fine. Dude, I got to tell you, it's really me and you versus the wording on the questions, Greg. So I love it when people shift the verbs or shift the nouns. And I got to tell you, this woman once said, the word more doesn't function in your question because <laughs> you know a couple of these questions at the beginning is it more this or more that like you know feeling and thinking are we more feeling or more thinking me i mean you gave the right answer we're both but we invented these words thinking and feeling so we think we can separate them and you know i like your your positiveness was yeah, we're 60, 80% curious and 20% fear, you know? So we do suss out these sort of biases that we want to uphold, but there's not, nothing is more this or more that. It just is. But here's a funny backup. Our next question is, what's faster, speed of light or speed of thought? That's 
an excellent question. <laughs> and, and I, I, and I would, I would venture not, not being a physicist by any stretch, I would venture to guess that they move at the exact same speed of light because, go. because a thought is a light is, is an yeah. electrical impulse. So yeah. yes, I think they move at the same speed. Yeah. That's good. And again, here's the other thing. I'm just after your hunch, your guess. And if you feel certain, that's good. If you say, I don't know, that's I'm not trying to put you on the spot and try to trick you, you know, and what, oh, I couldn't like Re Rebecca Solnit said it so well, just because you ask me a question doesn't mean I have to answer it, you know, and I'm all for that. Some people go, I can't answer that. And I go, that's all right. So, you know, that you get Audre Lorde, the poet said, you can't dismantle the master's house using the master's tools. Yvonne Rayner responded and said, you can if you expose the tools. What new tool do you suggest? For dismantling the master's house? Good question, because I just because I open some of these questions with cute quotes doesn't mean you have to apply it. The basic question is, what tool do you gravitate towards? You can add the word new if you want, and you can add to dismantle the master's well, house. I think it's you. an excellent quote. I, I, yeah. Uh, Audre Lorde's quote is excellent, but I also think it's hyperbolic and, 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 and literally wrong yeah. on a literal level. Because yeah. those are exactly the tools you would use to physically dismantle the master's house and to build a new house. Yeah. And and, and you can apply that, you can apply that, apply that to art too. I I, I mean, you know, the, uh, apply it to filmmaking. We have, you know, you if you take a movie, um, uh, the kind of movie that, like the master's movie, you know, like Spider-Man or something, which is the master's house of movies. Uh, if I'm going to dismantle the master's house of movies, uh, I'm going to be using the same tools that the master used to make that. Yeah. House. yeah. Well, that's, uh, you know, Frank Zappa said, who are the brain police? So that might be, you know, who's the master there? Is it metaphorically the master? Was she, she was, you know, probably saying white supremacy, but it is can be applied metaphorically, and when McLuhan, uh, when uh, Zappa said, "Who are the brain police?" He uh, he wasn't telling you they're the you know consumer capitalism or they're the voice inside your head. He was just posing it as a question, and then he was the one who said, "If you want to change things, you got to work within the system," you know. So, anyways, uh, what new toy do you suggest? A new toy, do I suggest? I should ask my wife. <laughs> uh, you know, there are so many new toys. <laughs> and I find I find myself working uh, with a lot of young people. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 and when I say young people, I mean anyone younger than me. I yeah. mean, you know, work, working with people in their 20s, and 30s um there is they they display a very common american trait maybe it's a very common young person trait that we all had when we were young which is a uh a, a just just a complete abandonment of anything that isn't happening right now uh whether that is technological or artistic there is this love of the now at the yeah. expense of of forgetting and dismissing anything that might have come before it yeah so you, you know so i although i'm using a computer which i use for work and i have a uh an iphone um i also listen to r vinyl records and CDs, as well as you know, listening to music on Spotify. Yeah. So, and, and I listen to the radio, which, when you talk to somebody in their twenties, they don't even know that radio exists. Yeah. It's not. They don't even listen to radio in their cars. They, the first thing they do when they get in their car is they hook their music up 
yeah. to the stereos. So all they're getting is the recycled trash that yeah. it, it, that that they've curated for themselves, and are are only exposed to new things that are that fit the algorithm that they have created for themselves. Yeah. So I, I mean that this is like another another thing that I like to to wax philosophical on, which is the yeah. importance of of libraries. And I consider radio as being a form of 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 library, auditory library, is that you need exposure to things that you're not looking for. Yeah. And 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 that I think uh, that's vital to you know to human modern human development, but it's also vital to being an artist. Is yeah. happening upon something that you would never have, w w you weren't looking for. You know, yeah. you're going through the radio stations trying to find, trying to find uh, uh, that rock song you like, and you happen upon Mozart, and you're yeah. not looking for Mozart, but there he is, and you pause, you pause for three seconds. What is this? Yeah, it's in there, and then it's a part of you. It's in there, yeah. and you're aware of it. But if you never have that opportunity to look around the shelves and go, "What the hell is this? This is not what I'm looking for." Oh, that, that's weird, you know. And put it back. Even you've been exposed to it, as opposed yeah. to n knowing nothing about it. And and um, I don't I I don't know where this came from, but I think it's related to something that you asked. Yeah, no, it was good, Greg, because uh, Forbes magazine said that millennials want to return to the pre-internet time. It's like, yeah, right. Because I, 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 I mean, who knows? You know, when you read surveys and data, you know, who, who did the survey? But it's interesting to hear that. And um, you brought up a topic that I want to veer off on in a, for a second because you brought up the value of libraries. You know, I'm all for the futurist, the Italian art movement, who said, destroy all museums and libraries. Although I've spent half my life in a library, that's my favorite place is bookstores and libraries. So I don't really want to destroy them, but I like the idea that some artists said, no, we got to destroy this because it's almost philosophically rooted in my love of Eastern philosophy, which is be here now. You even said this. They want a nowness, you know, and, and Ram Dass said it well, be here now. Wyndham Lewis said, artists live in the present and write a detailed history of the future. So you want to be present and you don't want to uh, uh, abandon your love of radio and these old technologies, vinyl, uh, TV guide, magazines. I'm a magazine freak too. But this re project we're working on right now is archiving. Is archiving more innate or more invented? Did, you know, these Egyptians put stuff in their tombs because it was innate or was it invented? The idea of being, a, you know, library science. Is, is that archiving information in a building, books, is that innate in humans or invented? I think it's more innate in many mammal species to want to collect and surround yourself with identifying objects of comfort. I don't think it's necessarily a human trait. I think it's, it's more of an animal trait. I think if you, we had a dog who needed to have his ball and his toy when he went to sleep near him, just like my two year old daughter who's napping right now, as we speak, she wouldn't nap without her little stuffed bunny and her yeah. and her pacifier. Yeah. And and, and I, I think that animals, certain animals and humans find comfort in in their things. And yeah. We we all like you know uh the 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 um Charles Schultz character Linus is a great human archetype. You know, he carried a security blanket with him wherever he went. And that's a very, not that we, not that, you know, many people do that, but it's a very relatable trait that our things, 
give us comfort and therefore become a defining characteristic of ourselves. Yeah, that was us with transistor radios and now us with cell phones. <laughs> you know, I, guess- I, asked, I asked this guy recently, what's the, what's the most important question you can ask? And he goes, where's my cell phone? <laughs> yeah. And then he said something like, well, what's the meaning of life? But it was like, okay, so you're, you're archive yourself besides collecting vinyl records and books or whatever, your creative output in making these films over the years, there's hard drives or, you know, preparation notes. There's a Greg archive. Is it been dealt with? Do you have plans? Or if you just die, you expect your wife to take care of it. Your thoughts on your own archive. You know, unfortunately, that's something that uh, I think everybody thinks about. And I I know that I've thought about it probably for 20 years. Like what, what, like if I'm going to be remembered, well, first of all, do I want to be remembered? Second of all, if I'm going to be remembered, who's going to curate those memories and what, and and who what version of me are they going to remember are yeah. they going to remember are they going to remember the guy who did a handful of of movies of independent movies are they going to are they going to remember the guy uh with with storage lockers full of beautiful art and projects that have never been realized you know, are they going to see my operas and my musicals and my plays and my novels? <laughs> you know, is that a part of my memory? It's a part of my my being right now while I'm alive. Yeah. But that's not going to survive. And, but is know, that source is that source material for your up and coming projects? Do you go back into those archives, or? Sure. Yeah. You, yeah. you, you mind them. Okay. So yeah. we did archiving good. We'll probably come back to that. So um, what do you worry about when you go to bed at night? This is going to sound, in, this is going to sound um, very unphilosophical, and very pedestrian, but I worry about money. That's all right. No worries. That's, that's, I, I want people to be down to earth, honest, and, and just, you know, I appreciate that. Okay. McLuhan learned from Ezra Pound that artists are the antenna of the race. They're broadcasting and detecting the hidden psychic effects of our inventions. So we might be able to learn how to cope with what we don't like about our inventions. So, uh, Greg, I asked you the question Marshall probed his whole career. Why do we ignore the hidden psychic effects of our inventions, even though the artists are broadcasting them to us? Well, I I think that this question, the answer to this question predates, predates, McLuhan and all that we can go back to the Greeks yeah. and ask the same question when the Greeks went to see a drama that dealt with themes universal themes um, uh, often these themes were about repressed emotions and unspoken emotions and unspoken secrets uh, there is something inherently human about this is that we going back to your first question what what is what is the most important thing uh uh, whatever your question was when i what's the best best thing for a human being yeah is uh, other people yeah and 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 that acknowledgement whether it's conscious or unconscious uh we all realize it and and we all want to be with other human beings. We all want to be seen by other human beings. And we unconsciously know that in order to achieve that 
important level of happiness by being with other people, we can't share everything. And so we yeah. learn to repress it on some unconscious instinctual level. I wouldn't, I shouldn't say instinctual because it's not an instinct. It's just an intrinsic, uh, uh, unacknowledged way of dealing with things is that we, we are basically walking around with walking around. Uh, we're basically like a, a a uh, walking sausage stuffed with secrets that <laughs> nobody can see. And the more we smile, the less secrets we think we project. <laughs> and so we need people to, to expose those secrets for us through other ways, through other cathartic means like by yeah. art, art or theater or music. And so that we can secretly relate to things that we don't want to share with other people because we'll lose that in, that essential connection, perhaps. So, yeah. So just to clarify, that was really well put, was you're saying, why do we ignore these hidden psychic effects? Because it's sort of like what keeps us going. Because if we we realize, because some people go, I don't ignore them. I know that artists are, are you know, are ex, uh, um, you know, <clears throat> exposing or broadcasting these hidden psychic effects, and I know how to deal with these inventions. So you know, some that was really well done because it it really evoked one of my favorite Bob Dylan denialisms, as it's called, Bob Dylan said he learned from the bible don't ever tell anyone everything you know <laughs> which is so funny because it's like how you and will met you're sitting in a park you know watching your kids frolic around and then you start talking you go wow i want to know everything you know and you tell me everything i you know and you're like you relate to someone at a party and you're like wow ah, you know very, very true. Yeah. <laughs> Good advice. Do artists have moral obligation? Well, interesting, because you 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 named a, an an artistic movement, uh, an artistic movement uh, rooted in fascism, and a poet also very sympathetic to fascism, which yeah. you can argue are two very uh, uh, two. Uh, uh, is quite immoral, perhaps, depending on what side you're on. Yeah. So, um, n no, art has no moral obligation. Absolutely not. Um, you know, yeah, I, 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 I love the poetry of Ezra Pound. I, I you know, uh, I, I have friends who won't read Ezra Pound because of his sympathies yeah. for fascism. I'm an anti-fascist, but I can appreciate his poetry. Um, the Futurist Movement, I can't deny its importance and its kind of uh, brilliance and, it, and, yeah. and its, its revolutionary approach to art. Um, but, uh, but um, I, you know, if you bring morality into it, then what do you do? Burn, burn any knowledge of Futurism? Yeah. Uh, no. Well, that's you. You're separating the art from the artist. That's a, a commendable trait, I believe. Not easy to do in 2023. Not easy to do because my friend teaches film, and he can't teach Woody Allen. I was just going to say, and, and you know, it's like, dude, the guy's, you know, he's a great filmmaker, 40 films in 40 years, blah blah blah, but he can't, and he wants to, but he just says, I can't. Cause I, I, you know, I'll get blackballed or fired or whatever. And so, you know, you, you, you know, it. And, and there's no right or wrong answers to any of these questions, but that one you got right. That is everybody, everybody, Greg, everybody says, well, everybody has a moral obligation. I goes, I know that, but do artists have a moral obligation? My opinion is art, great art does two things. It fucks your shit up. And 
says to you, oh, I could do that. I mean, not, you know, it's a generalization, but it really affects you. Well, because so, even when you say I could do that, even if, yeah. even though most people can't do that, but when they feel that I can do that, That's it's it. because they relate to something universal in yeah. that art that they understand. And we, which again, I mean, art should or shouldn't do anything except yeah. it be an expression of human beings uh, or humanity. And you can define humanity however you want. So, our, you know, I don't, I don't think art should have rules. Yeah. Uh, That's Tony yeah. Conrad nailed it. He said, artists break rules that haven't been made yet. That's like mind blowing, but it is, we're going to get into the, the function and motives of art in a second, but it's like you having the dream. Oh, we're going to have this thing built. No, you can't. Well, no. Well, well what about plan B? Can't do it. But you, you were driven to have that vision. So that's what is important. And then you can express it to me. So are you more afraid of new ideas or more afraid of old ideas? I, I'm more afraid of old ideas. Yeah. Be, be, because uh, the odds are that uh, it's already been done because it's an old yeah. idea. Can you conjure up your earliest memory ever or one of them? Yes. And describe it just briefly. Uh, not very interesting, but I have a memory of being about two years old on the roof of our building on the north side of Chicago, eating yogurt for the first time. Yeah, that's great. I remember the first time I ate yogurt too. It was like, what is, that's good. Is memory more a curse or more a blessing? Memory is an intrinsic defining feature of our species and most species there's no separation between memory and humanity even if you have amnesia if you have amnesia your 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 most vital directive is to find or replace memories so we don't function without memory for one thing we're the only species the only mammal born without instincts. We have no instincts, scientifically speaking. People often confuse the term instinct for something else, but we have no instincts. Therefore, everything we know is learned and taught to us. Yeah. Everything from which berries to eat so we don't die to, uh, you know, to how to tie our shoes, yeah. to how to read. Everything is taught to us. And that relies on memory. So there is no separation of our species from memory. Yeah, that's um, Joyce says in Finnegan's Wake, remember to forget. But what you just said, you know, the other word from amnesia, I got to get this book for one second. Hold on, because all um, right, this is um, Philip, Philip K. Dick. Yeah, is illustrated by. Um, R. Crumb. And uh, I was shocked to hear this uh, in regards to memory. It was sort of like a new thing. And then my one of someone I interviewed told me this is a Borges short story. And it is the Greek word A-N-A-M-N-E-S-I-S. -S. So you brought up amnesia. This is anem. I'm not pronouncing it good. A-N-A-M-N-E-S-I-S. It's the Greek word meaning loss of forgetfulness. A nemesis. Yeah, so it's the opposite. You can't forget anything. What was the Joyce quote again? Remember to forget. <laughs> Funny, because there's an Irving Berlin song that says, what? you forgot to remember. Oh my God, you forgot to remember. Do you know the name of the song? 
Yeah, the song is called Remember by Irving Berlin. It's a beautiful song. Written oh, I like that. In the that, early 20s, I believe. That is super important because this whole thing. And then have you ever seen Sans Soleil by mm -hmm. Chris Marker? Yes. Oh, yeah. That, what was that, the 80s? Yeah, it could be late 70s, 80s, but it is basically this uh, – it's it. It's all about memory too. But that was good. So, can you tell me someone within your immediate family, please, and then outside your immediate family, just briefly, who had an impact on you, kind of like a role model, and what specifically was that impact? That's that's a very a very tough question. You know, it, it it's it's unfair when you have somebody like Stephen Sondheim when he's interviewed and he's asked that question and he always talks about Oscar Hammerstein being his greatest influence. And he used to say if, if Oscar Hammerstein was a carpenter, he would have become a carpenter. And wow. You mean he, Sondheim knew Oscar they grew up. He he was friends with his son, and, oh, he, and they grew he up. Was... And they grew up, and uh, uh, they, they, Sondheim, their country homes were were they were neighbors as yeah. as a child. So Sondheim yeah. spent, spent so much of his childhood with Oscar Hammerstein in, in his home that he he worshipped the guy, and it just so happened that uh, Hammerstein was a lyricist, um, and that's what Sondheim became before he yeah. became even a composer. Yeah. Um, I wish I had something, somebody like that. Um, but inside your immediate family, wasn't I mean, your dad? Family, I, I would have to say, I would ha have to say it was my father. My father was, uh, more so than he even knows, and uh, than he even realizes that, you know, e everything I, uh, everything I, uh, I know to be true about how to be an adult, even though it didn't really stick with me. Like it didn't, I, you know, I didn't do what he did, but right. I knew, I knew where the bar was. Yeah. You know, you know, for better or for worse, you know, and oftentimes it's for the worse. My father, uh, you know, doesn't, you know, wasn't always a great communicator, but he was always a great father. Yeah. And my father, uh, you know, I don't, you know, he gave birth to a guy, to a kid who from an early age just wanted to, to draw and paint and make music and then film. And I don't know if my father could totally relate to that because, you know, he grew up at a, at a time when you really, you just needed to figure out how to make a living. And, yeah. and, um, you know, I, I, I never figured that out, I guess. But yeah, my father was is still is. He's still, you know, he's still in great shape and he's a very supportive and he, he's a great influence. But but um, you know, he's no Oscar Hammerstein. What dude, I love it. You taught me the the where the bar is. It was like, you mean the the bar to get a drink or the bar? You know, I know what you meant, but it, it literally it was a great thing that it's open up for interpretation. But, you know, Oscar Wilde, when my female friends were turning 50, I'm 70. When they were turning 50, they fretted becoming their mothers. And Oscar Wilde said, women fret becoming their mothers. Men don't. That's their problem. Because most most of us are raised more by our mothers because our dads are at work. Yeah. But but it is interesting that you still can turn to understanding what kind of influence he did have on you. So now the same question outside your immediate family, someone who had an impact on you, and what was that impact? Hmm. God, this is a really um, this is a this is a really hard question, and I should I should think about this more. 
and it's really hard for me to pinpoint one particular person uh you know who i could say is responsible for for influencing me uh i mean i i I've, I've had mentors over the years and inadvertent mentors um and i had a mentor who i met when i was too old to have a mentor and and he became one of my closest friends he was about 40 years older than me he was a great filmmaker um uh, one of my favorite filmmakers, Paul Mazursky, who, when I was a teenager, I saw his first two movies uh, and they kind of changed my life in a, in a weird way. When I was a teenager, I saw Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice. Yep. And I thought, wow, that it, it blew my mind because I realized what movies could actually be about. Yeah that that you could go so deep into the human psyche and into relationships and and still be so funny about it uh i was very influenced by him as a, as a as a student and then i i happened to meet him one day in los angeles about 20 years ago it must have been 20 years ago at the farmer's market. If, if anybody knows where that is at Fairfax and third, the old original farmer's market in Hollywood. And I was sitting at a table having coffee by myself. And at the next table, Paul, Paul Mazursky sat down. Uh, and I, 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 I was, I was in awe. I was starstruck, but I also had to play it cool because I didn't want to, um, you know, I didn't want to freak him out, but I needed to talk to him. I needed to acknowledge that that I knew who he was and what a huge influence he had been on me. And so I struck up a conversation with him and he took a liking to me immediately and we became fast friends. We became very close friends over the next 15 years. And, and he became one of my best friends uh, right up until the day he died. How cool. Yeah. What was the other film, Greg? Because you mentioned Bob and Ted, and you were going to say a second film. Uh, uh, it was um, a film he wrote before before uh, Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice. It was called I Love You, Alice B. Toklas, which I'm oh, sure yeah. you remember, with Peter Sellers. Yeah. And, and it, again, very, very timely film made in the late 60s about the hippie movement about counterculture, about um, uh, about a man, a lawyer, who uh, is doing what he thinks he's supposed to be doing, which is living the middle class dream, and uh, and he's not happy. Yeah, and and he has a kind of a midlife crisis and embraces the counterculture to such a degree that it becomes ridiculous. And uh, it's, it's a, if, if anybody ha who's listening to this hasn't seen it, they should revisit I Love You, Alice B. Toklas. Because it really, it was the first time you ever saw somebody eat pot brownies in a movie. <laughs> and I, I'm showing a clip in a presentation at the Venice Heritage Museum in a, in a couple weeks. Oh, uh, wow. A great clip is, you know, you see those archways in Venice because they yeah. shot. Some, yeah. And my That's friend's right. my friend's dad is in. But uh, did, did, these were two films that affected you before you met him. Yes. Oh, then did you, did you eventually watch Alex, uh, Alex in Wonderland? Yes, I've seen Alex in Wonderland. Yeah. yeah. That, that, that one, um, everything he does, knowing him, everything he does is interesting but also pretentious because he really, no. Paul Mazursky wanted to be Fellini and, <laughs> and he really did. He worshiped Fellini. And um, sometimes that Fellini influence um, overwhelmed his natural sensibility. And it was almost like an identity crisis. Yeah. Where, where it, it you know, it was Paul Mazursky as dressed up like Fellini. Yeah. Uh, this is, 
Yeah, this is a major thing. Uh, the <clears throat> Harold Bloom's uh, anxiety of influence. You absorb your influence, then you abandon them. Like, yes. good luck. <laughs> you know, oh, how no. do you not? Be it's absolutely, hard. Though. It, it yeah. absolutely. Like, I, I remember. I remember being a teenager, being influenced by an older kid. I wanted to just be him. Yeah. And, and you know, and I did everything I could to become this guy. Yeah. And so I absorbed him, but then quickly, you know, realized that I, I wasn't him. And so you yeah. shed those, those skins, but you still have the essence of what attracted you to them. Yeah. Whether it was their wit or their, or their talent or whatever it was. Yeah, it's like uh, how I define Zappa and Preston Sturgis. They both were alchemists. They they took two known things, put them together, invented a third unknown thing. You know, Absolutely. theatrical theatrical rock or screwball comedy. But then the key to those great artists was then they satirized their new invention. Yeah. So they wouldn't even take seriously, like, oh, I invented this and now it's me and blah, blah, blah. But uh, did it? I I know I've interviewed a guy who writes books on all these people, Bob Fosse. Didn't Sam Wasson write the book on Mazursky? Sammy is a very close friend of mine. Yeah, and, I and, and I mentioned in the Mazursky book as well. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. Because Sam, I I interviewed Sam. I tried to interview Sam for many years because he he came to our Finnegan's Wake reading club once, and I oh, finally wow. I. I finally interviewed him and I, I love him. His, his stuff is, he, he's got this line I always repeat from the Fosse book. Fosse's dancers kind of acted like they were dancing. They weren't dancing. They like act. And that's what you, you know, going back to, you know, absorbing your influence. Well, you don't want to act like them you want to sort of fake that you're acting like them or it's really goes to the master. Buster Keaton, turn your stumble into a dance. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Sammy um, is a, a tremendous writer. Yeah. And, and, and did you read his last book about um, making of Chinatown? I wish I did. I should. It's, yeah. it's riveting. It's fascinating yeah. and it's riveting. And uh, he made a mistake in the book, which I called him to uh, to correct him, because there's a scene in Chinatown where Jack Nicholson receives a phone call and is told to show up to an address. He gets to this address and he finds the woman who initially came into his office to hire him dead on her kitchen floor in her apartment. Yeah, and and he pulls out her SAG card, her Screen Actors Guild card, and gets her real name. And realizes that she was an actress hired to portray Faye Dunaway. Yeah. Um, that scene was shot two doors down from where I live. Right. And which is on Ken's East Kensington Road. And in the book, Sammy refers to it as Kensington Street. And oh my God! And, uh, I corrected him, and he was beside himself. <laughs> he made such an error. That is, no he he answered all these questions, and he is deep because it's always like, what's going to be your next project? You know, he's just right. like, and his mentor is quite amazing too. You know that Jean, what's her name, Jean something i want to say bennington gene the the woman he learned from in college oh right i don't remember her name. yeah but that's funny because i saw at usc once robert town speak with his private copy 35 millimeter like mint copy of chinatown wow and but he's a doozy. <laughs> have you ever studied him talking about films? It's like, uh oh. <laughs> yeah. So, um, did your parents raise you a particular religion? No. Well, yes, I should say yes. I was raised Jewish, but we were very Reformed Jewish, uh, which means that we, we, um, you, we, we didn't recognize all of the traditions and all of the holidays. We celebrated the high holidays 
I, I was forced to go to Hebrew school and to be bar mitzvahed. Um, I, and I was indoctrinated uh, through religious schools uh, on the weekends um, so that I would grow up to have unwavering support for Israel. Um, uh, so I was raised Jewish, but not you, very Jewish. Do you pray? No, not, 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 not to a specific deity. Yeah. If God does exist, what would you like God to say to you after you die? That he understands me and forgives me. Heavy, dude. Do evil people exist or does evil use people as a vehicle? Evil people definitely exist. Um, nobody thinks they're evil. <clears throat> and I think that, that e evil or what we would define as evil is often endorsed by society so that evil people believe they're acting morally. Um, I, I mean, take something as simple as a landlord. As a, a landlord, I heard a, a scholar, he says, don't say landlord, call them rent collectors. <laughs> That's good. Because, because, uh, um, uh, what we, we what we traditionally call landlords. First of all, to use a, a feudal term like landlord uh, in this day and age is bizarre to say the least. Yeah. But if we look at what a, a rent collector's contribution to society is, yeah, um, they're essentially they're, uh, essentially like a medieval leech. <laughs> they do they do why don't we call wait greg why do we call all oh, the medieval leeches here <laughs> yeah i can't pay the rent you <laughs> must pay the rent uh so i would say collecting collecting rent yeah in order in order to shelter you and your family i would say that that is it, that is an intrinsically evil act uh, to extort to extort somebody's to extort somebody's life um, is, is an evil act, <clears throat> but it's an evil act sanctioned as a moral act by yeah. by this particular society. So I don't know how you define evil. Yeah, I mean, well, what's more evil than that? Yeah, it's like. Uh... And then how surreal can you get when the government, when COVID hits, goes, you can't collect rent now. <laughs> and like people are like, what? <laughs> and, right. and, 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 uh, and animals are running in the street and there's no traffic and you, you get rent free. It's like, what? This is like unbelievable. So uh, what you said, though, was really good because, you know, John Waters is getting his big due at the academy. He, he says a line I love. He rooted for the Wicked Witch. Like how many people ever watched a uh, watch Wizard of Oz? And you know, like the dude isn't that weird. He he grew up and his parents love him and he had a loving life and he's sure. been successful and he's an artist. But he rooted, like, is that wrong? Is he rooting for the evil guy? So, you I know. I, I think that, again, might have been slightly hyperbolic. I, I had uh, yeah, Wizard of Oz, like many people, yeah. wa was one of the most impactful, influential yeah. movies that I ever saw. Oh, At a time when, when you know, I saw that movie, I was six years old, and I remember it changing my life at six years old. And yeah. of course the character that I wanted to be, that I wanted to dress as, that I wanted to, you know, that I, I would never forget was the Wicked Witch. Yeah. I, 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 I don't necessarily, I wasn't necessarily rooting for her, <laughs> but I certainly loved her more than any of the other characters. Wait, you dressed up as the Wicked Witch for Halloween? I, 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 
I not for Halloween. I did it for fun. Oh, and okay. I remember, oh, okay. I remember, <laughs> I remember being six or seven years old, wanting to dress as the witch, and and I don't remember, and it wasn't my father, but somebody because <laughs> I remember that it was not my father. Somebody said to me, "You can't dress like the witch. You're a boy." Oh my god! And they put the fear. The fear of the feminine in me at that point. And, and I wanted, you know, if, if somebody said, yes, be a witch, I might, you know, I might be a drag queen right now. <laughs> but, and making a lot more money. <laughs> but, you know, I, I got two questions, Greg, to go back. One was, uh, one is a comment. When I saw, I mean, the Oz had Wizard of Oz, which McLuhan's words so well, the Wizard of Oz, in well, McLuhan view, in what is, what is advertising, sky writing, in what does the wizard want you to bring them, the writing utensil, and then what is the dog, Toto, but you and me, the artists who pull the curtain back and reveal what's really happening. They're the atomic dogs. So it's amazing thing what Wizard of Oz set up, this template, this, this sort of myth, this beyond Joseph Campbell by a million years, what the Oz did to us. And I saw it in college after being ingrained on a TV set. Yeah, that when, when I saw it in college on the big screen, I knew where every commercial break was. <laughs> like I was like, oh, now I get up and go get food. I like wait, it's I can't, you know, like but it's, so it was amazing. I want you to go back if you could. You've used the word twice. What does hyperbolic mean in layperson's term? What's another word for it? What are you saying with that word? I guess I, I mean I. I, I might even be misusing it, but what I, I mean is, um, is, is, is kind of an extreme metaphor. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, to, you know, to, to, to make, to, um, uh, to, to illustrate a point, to illustrate a point you're saying yeah. you're over-exaggerating something. Yeah. No, that's good. I just wanted to be clear. That's fine. So um, the evil people question really is this. How do you advise someone to deal with an enemy? And I'll set it up with some modern thinkers. Alan Watts says, if you acknowledge your enemy, you empower them. Coppola stole from the mob and the samurais. Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. JFK said, forgive your enemy but don't forget their name. And Fellini says, I need an enemy. So it's a lot of thoughts. A basic question is, how do you advise someone to deal with an enemy? But first, how would you respond to Alan Watts? If you acknowledge your enemy, you empower them. I, I think of all of those credos, his is probably the best. Wow. Uh, and I'm, and, and I, I, I envy the ability to do that and to think that way. Um, yeah. I, you know, I, I don't like to, I don't like to acknowledge that I may have enemies um, because that, that's a, that's a, 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 a footing, a combative footing. That's a yeah. presumption, a presumption of something bellicose in your life. Um, so yes, I, I mean, you know, I'll give you I'll give you a great example. Um, as a cafe I go to all the time. I, I, almost every day I go to this coffee house. It's a bookstore and a coffee house in my neighborhood. There is a barista who works there who for whatever reason can't stand me. Uh, I, I don't know why. I would say she's probably the closest thing I have to an enemy that I'm aware of. Um, but I, I don't, I, I don't acknowledge it and I don't give her the, the, uh, yeah. you know, the power to be my enemy, but, but it, it is, it is miraculous. Cause you know, I'm a very likable person. <laughs> <laughs> 
I don't, I don't, I, you know, people who are working, I, I, you know, I, I admire them and I treat them well. Yeah. Uh, you know, I treat them like human beings, like I want to be treated. You know, I, yeah. I, you know, I'm a big proponent of the golden rule, but yeah. there are just, no matter how hard you try with certain people, you are not yeah. going to uh, get the love that you um, think you are entitled to. Yeah. And I think, I think Greg, this is comes up recently. That's her way of saying she loves you and she needs you. She doesn't know how to express it. So it comes off like I have no people like this. You're a fucking asshole. You 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 do this. You get, you know, it's it's it really is something deeper that they can't express, but they're reaching out, going, help me, you know. But it's like, well, then tell me you need help, <laughs> you know, or talk to me on real terms. But they they don't have that ability. I don't know. That's just one thought that I've had in that conundrum because i go i think everybody goes through that no i don't i don't i think that if you if you look at life like this like yeah like like most people do yeah um uh you're kind of no different even even if yeah. the cause you're fighting for is the righteous yeah. cause you're no different so yeah. you know that 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 so i i believe in a more uh uh, I'm a I'm a Marxist, and I don't mean Karl Marx. I mean the Marx Brothers. That's, <laughs> that's how you fight an enemy. You, you do it the that, way the Marx Brothers would do it. That is so good. That's like the Marx Brothers. Go back to our thinking talk early. The Marx Brothers are in a jam, and they go, "We got to think." And he go, "We already tried that." <laughs> <laughs> then, then, I have a million think quotes. Captain Beefheart says, "I had too much to think." <laughs> that's funny but um this is uh nasim talib said games were created to give non-heroes the illusion of winning in real life we don't know who wins or loses but we can tell who a hero is then my friend said well villains don't think they're bad they want control heroes want freedom you know, Gregory Bateson, the anthropologist, says if the criminal gets caught, does he go, whoa, my criminal skills weren't up to snuff that day? Or does he go, I did something morally and socially wrong? So, again, it's a lot of prompts. But the basic question is, does punishment work? No. Yeah. No. So what do we do? <laughs> what's the what's the alternative? I mean that that's you know that's 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 the question. That's the question yeah. that's been plaguing philosophers for you know long before Michel Foucault when he wrote it. <laughs> and survey what was it surveillance and punishment or something? I'm yeah mistranslating it but uh um you know th that's a question i i don't feel like i i i have uh yeah. any need to answer yeah I, I, you know just because i say no punishment doesn't work Pun you know punishment is not a there, there's no way to do the only way to to deter crime is, is two ways is to is to take away take away the uh, take away the IV tube of despair and de and desperation. Yeah, and that's number one. And number two is to raise nicer kids so that they yeah. become nicer parents. Yeah. But number one is the primary because you can raise you know you can raise the nicest kid in the world if he's if he needs to eat. And and when I say he needs to eat, that that doesn't just literally mean food. It yeah. means you know, you know, if he needs to fight to survive like that, you yeah. know, if, if, you know, if, if, if bum rushing a Neiman Marcus, are there Neiman Marcuses anymore? I don't even know. <laughs> Whatever you mean, what they're doing in LA now. Yeah. If bum rushing a Nordstrom and stealing as much crap off the racks as you can <laughs> is one option of many, then we're doing something wrong.
Allah, what is that? Where did that come from? So you take away the need for yeah. that as an option. You take away that option, and that option doesn't get taken away by more punishment and more police. It's taken away by taking the, the need away. And then all of a sudden, yeah. that's not an option. Because yeah. all anybody really wants is to be happy and comfortable. Yeah. And and the more stressors we put on people, the more desperate they act. Yeah. It's probably le- it's easier. I knew a guy who bought Gucci bags from China that were knockoffs, <laughs> and he made a lot of money selling them online. And so, I mean, that's cheating the system, but it did. It's it's less likely you're going to get busted bad like a cop's going to shoot you because you broke the glass in a i i have i i have more respect for that that i would put into the category of con man yeah and i think a con man is a hero there you go wow that's heavy a con man a con man is does not victimize people yeah a con man has a an intrinsic symbiotic relationship with their marks yeah. who volunteer for that relationship. Yeah. Yeah, that's very funny because I'm making this film and I keep telling the guy I'm a snake oil salesman. That's a con. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a con man. And you know what? I'm- it's perfectly legitimate. It's it's Mr. Mr. Haney in Green Acres. <laughs> oh yeah, of course. I remember that. I you know, tr- Trump is a con man. Oh I yeah. Think Trump is a con man, which is why and we love con men. I because know. we 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 love to see them work. We yeah. you know, di- you know, take you know, any movie about a con man, you're never yeah. rooting against him. It's all a film noir. It's all, all the film noir guys are like, oh, they're romantic. And then they're a little Weasley. So, you know, it's like we, we relate to them in their romance, but then we're like, oh, we're, so this is what you brought up is interesting because having a child, that's how we met through you and Will having kids is McLuhan says this thing that I I don't understand what he's saying, but I'm going to I'm going to give you basically what I think he's saying. And you tell me your opinion, okay. saying that humans shape their behavior with experience when we kind of should shape it with experience. I, excuse me, with understanding. So it's it's putting experience and understanding up. And like what's important. So, of course, there's a lot of wordage there to decipher out what do those words mean. And I put in this, like, your daughter comes in from the cold in Chicago. And you go, honey, if you go up to the stove and you rub your hands close, you can warm your hands up. That's teaching her the dynamics of heat. That's understanding. If she walks in and go, don't touch the stove, that's experience. So how do you differentiate between understanding and experience in shaping human behavior? Hmm. Well, I think that, I mean, the way I interpret it is experience versus understanding is... Uh, I, I look at it in terms of uh, selfishness versus compassion. Okay. I, I see uh, understanding the world or understanding another person is is not holding your experiences sacred. Because I think what a lot of people do is they lionize their experience and and, you know, if I could do it, they could do it. You know, if I could get a job, they could get a job. Yeah. And, and I, I think our experiences are only valid for ourselves. And the minute we try and impose our experiences on other people, we've lost the understanding. Yeah. That is really. So you're saying experience is sort of in that realm of selfishness. Understanding is in the realm of compassion. So well put. 
my wife said something once to me and said, you know, well, you do that. And I goes, get your own bad habits. <laughs> <laughs> so she wrote a song, get your own bad habits. It's like, yeah. Right. Like, so um, James Joyce was the first projectionist in Dublin a hundred years ago. He basically checked out Volta Cinema. He said, this is stupid. Why should I go inside a building and see a movie of a tree when I can go outside and see a real tree? Years later, Faulkner said, sometimes the best fiction is more true than journalism. Why do we have to recreate things in order to get them? Why do we have to go to a theatrical play of people acting out life? Why don't we just live life? Yeah. I mean... <laughs> That 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 it's it, it, it's a a great question that contains its own answer. Because, <laughs> well, what? It? Because obviously, obviously, we need it. Obviously, we need to see that tree on film or on a canvas when yeah. we can see a tree because we want to see things interpreted. And yeah. I, and portrayed i mean it's again that is as as much a part of being human as anything i mean you know you you go back you go back 300,000 years when we're living at, when we're nomadic tribes in africa and we're sitting around the campfire eating mastodon well actually i don't even think they were at that point but you know, we're eating the day's the day's catch, uh, sitting around the campfire. You're telling me, and we're this species. We're these people. Like we're speaking. We might not be wearing clothes, but we're speaking. You're gonna tell me that there's not somebody there telling a story. Yeah. Around that campfire, bullshit. We're the same people then as we are now. Yeah. And so it's it's just part of who we are. Yeah, that's good. Um, in fact, Hollis Frampton, great experimental filmmaker, said, narrative is born among the animal necessities of the spirit because we're waiting to die. Can you forget to die? I think life is the endless pursuit of forgetting to die. Yeah. Absolutely. I think every time every time we derive pleasure from a connection or a laugh, we are doing that. Or the the byproduct of that is forgetting that we're going to die at that moment. Yeah. It's the, as as Ernst Becker said the denial of death. Yeah. Boy, that's a book that's really gotten a lot of play in contemporary cinema. I think it was. I th I think I think Woody Allen referenced it once. But I I don't mean directly even. No. I, I did, didn't uh, Kubrick use you know study it and you know oh, that I don't know. Yeah, but that makes sense. Yeah. Well, uh, Greg, uh, I asked for 90 minutes and we got 90. I was wondering if we could do part two because usually I get through about 40 questions and we got through uh, 12. <laughs> <You're> kidding. <laughs> well, no, I'm telling you, it's it's better now to put, see that my goal is basically to get deeper than people's stock lines, you know, and to go a little deeper. So I'm finding this is, better not rushing so much as I've done for 40 years trying, you know, I did, you know, liking old media, I defined the, the, uh, time on an audio cassette, 90 minutes. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Of yeah. Course. 45 minutes each side. And so now I'm realizing that I don't have to limit people and it is through anecdotes and storytelling that people flush out and get a little deeper, you know. You can't expect everybody to not rely on their stock lines. That's the other thing, you know. Yeah. 
I think, well, I, I think your questions make it very hard to fall back on, on stock lines because uh, I had no idea. Uh, I, I, you caught me completely off guard. I've never been asked these questions before. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I thought I thought we were going to talk about uh, camera lenses and mise en scene. But... <laughs> you, you're like this guy, really a great experimental filmmaker and curator in L.A., he was sitting in this very chair, and after about 40 minutes of these, he goes, aren't we going to talk about film? <laughs> but uh, indeed, we did, and, and I, I will s encourage you, let's just book a part two. This can be three, two, three months down the line. Most of the dates open now are in December, January, February. Book some in the future, and we'll, get, we'll definitely delve into writing in film because i didn't realize it sounds like you were kind of more first a writer than you were a maker well, if you wrote i'm sorry go ahead did you did you write books in in uh plays before you were making films i i i wrote i wrote some plays and i i started a i started a novel before i made films yeah but, but in uh but with that, that's for the second conversation. Yeah, see, yeah. This is why this is why structure is very important. <laughs> is, is you 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 really you need to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. It doesn't have to be uh, linear. It doesn't have to be narrative. But it needs to have a beginning and an end. Yeah, and you, that's the great Godard quote. Yeah, I believe in beginnings, middles, and ends, but not necessarily in that order. By the way. Means? Have you watched the trailer? You know, my thing, Greg, is just watch the trailer. You don't have to watch feature films anymore. I mean, I've really abandoned my love of cinema in, in by saying that. But watch the new Godard trailer, the Godard documentary trailer. Oh, yes, I oh. did see it. Yes. It's a mind blowing. It's like yes. wow. That that one I would want to see on the big screen, but, but you know. we 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 could talk about Godard. Uh, and feel feel free to watch a couple of my movies if you would like. If, well, which ones do you recommend? I would I would recommend two. I would recommend I would recommend uh, one of my first and then my last. So watch Dummy, which stars Adrian Brody and um, it has an all star cast that you'll recognize: Ron Liebman, Jessica Walter, Ileana Douglas, Mila Jovovich, Vera Farmiga. And Richard Harris's son, Jared Harris. Wow. And then, and that that actually that was shot twenty years ago. We just celebrated the twentieth anniversary. Uh, we were invited to to play at uh, Quentin Tarantino's New Beverly Cinema last week. And oh, how cool! It, yeah, it was it was an amazing evening. Um, big house sold out. It was really fabulous. Unfortunately, the cast couldn't attend because they're on strike and they can't go to movies that they're in, even if they're. Oh my God. But you could go. Oh, not, yeah. You could, you're not crossing the line by no. going. No. And you had dialogue with the audience and all that. Oh That's yeah, we did. I, I did a Q and a with the audience and it was. Who was the host? You know, I can't remember his name, but yeah. I'll, 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 I can't, I can't remember. I was introduced to him that evening, so I don't. What was the uh, for, what'd you show it on a DCP or a 30? No, 30, they only show 35 millimeter at the new 35 Bay. millimeter. How cool is that? Okay, yeah. and what's the, the latest film? The latest one is called The Mistress 2023, and it is uh, you can see it on Apple TV or iTunes or Amazon. And there's probably a million movies called The Mistress. Make sure this is the one by me yeah. from 2023. Yeah. And um, and also you'll you'll get to see the uh, the house I live in, and um, as well as the scene in the turret that you talked about. How yes, cool. that we spoke about. Yeah, and they're two very different films that'll give you a sense of my of my uh, whatever. Oh, well. Yeah, your whatever. It's called uh, auteur theory, right? Yeah. <laughs> My whatever. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, I, I was in uh, Andrew Saris's house once. 
and he yeah. walked him down the hallway and he goes, do you want to see Molly's bedroom? <laughs> It's like Molly Haskell's a great film writer. So is Andy. But for him to say, do you want to see this like her office bedroom? That was funny, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, thank Greg, you so much. Yeah. Really a pleasure, Greg. And I look forward to part two and I look forward to uh, talking in the future. Even though I'm hitting the end broadcast button, I hope we can keep talking forever and ever. I would love to. Thanks, Greg.